Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Pollan. And I'm Dallas Jones. This week on Red, White, and Blue, criminal justice reform. Where do we stand today with two guests who are going to illuminate that for us, Dallas? First, Mark Levin, who's Vice President of Criminal Justice for the Texas Public Policy Foundation in Austin and a previous guest. And a first-timer, but glad to have him, Dr. Howard Henderson, founding director of the Center for Justice Research and professor of Justice Administration at Texas Southern University. Welcome, Dr. Henderson. Thank you. Welcome. You go. Well, uh, uh, Gary, you're going to let me get the first you question? You get the first question. <laughs> well, you know, there's a God up there. Uh, well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask this question to both of you. Um, give me, a, you know, bring it down for us, but give me a, 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 just a quick uh, highlight of where do you see we are today in terms of criminal justice reforms and, and what's needed overall? So well, where we are and then where do we need to be? Well, the great news is Texas has been on the forefront of this. Uh, well, I'm not going to say since I started because a lot of people have had a hand in it, but really since 2007 when we adopted a justice reinvestment package where we said instead of building 17,000 more prisons beds, we would create more drug courts, uh, more treatment for people with mental illness, addiction, and so forth. And since that time, our crime rate's down 30 percent. Uh, our incarceration rate is down more than 20 percent. We've closed eight prisons. So things have been going really well. And uh, uh, so there's a lot Lot left to do, but uh, part of the reason we saw the first step back on the federal level is because uh, of the success in Texas and frankly a lot of other states, many of which are red states or uh, conservative states. So it shows this is a bipartisan effort uh, and that, you know, there's a way to uh, be tough on crime without being tough on taxpayers. I think the opportunity now is greater than before. We're now having a conversation about a debate between who can be more progressive in justice reform. But at the same time, Amber Geiger just happened. So we've got a long way to go. A lot of minorities are still unhappy with the criminal justice system. Well, you think Amber Geiger is a product of the criminal justice system or well, the fact she can't find her way to her own apartment? Uh, the latter point, right? <laughs> and so the, the, the issue is that the poor people are still unhappy. Uh, the working class are still unhappy with our justice system, and so we got to do a better job of making sure that they feel comfortable around police. All right, well, let me ask you this, uh, Dr. Henderson. Do we still have too many laws on the books, uh, that are, uh, criminal laws on the books in I, I, would, I would say so, right? Um, a lot of it, though, is also misunderstanding, right, and application of it. And at the local level, individuals still don't understand how they're processed through the system. People don't understand all the loopholes that are allowed. Poverty still affects you drastically. And we're in the birthplace of a, a current lawsuit that we still haven't figured out which way it's going to go. Well, we, yeah, we have over 1,500 crimes in Texas outside of the penal code. So those are not <laughs> the things like stealing or hurting someone. These are things like 11 felonies relating to harvesting oysters. Now, um, there was a woman arrested in Baytown several years ago for an overdue library book. Uh, another woman up in the Metroplex who had a warrant for her arrest for home baked goods in violation of city ordinance. Um, but, you know, so there are too many crimes, and there's so many that the average person can't figure out what's against the law or not. So the whole purpose of, uh, you know, Ten Commandments, right? Right? The idea is you know what they are and you can conform your conduct. So you're saying in Texas it's like 10,000 commandments. Exactly. So we're trying <laughs> to rein these in. We, we have repealed a few of them, like some crazy ones relating to secondhand watches, but we have a lot more to do on that. Have you found, uh, Mark, that uh, the legislature leaders, regardless of the party, are uh, amenable to getting rid of some of these ancillary criminal cases? Yeah, and even in the occupational licensing area, because violation of any occupational licensing rule is a Class B misdemeanor, punishable by up to a year in jail. So we were able to, for example, get rid of the whole shampooing occupational license. Uh, so you don't need a license to shampoo anymore. And then the other thing is we you passed... Could go, you could go to the county jail for shampooing <laughs> Without a license. Without a license. <laughs> but then we also passed a bill oh. to say people with a... <laughs> we passed a bill to say people with a criminal record this session, uh, if it was unrelated to occupation, they could get an occupational license, which of course is, a more, is going to affect a lot more people. And that uh, was a bill we worked on with Chairman Jeff Leach and uh, others. And, and so the idea is after you've done your time, you should be able to punch the clock. Uh, you should be able to make a living uh, for yourself and your family. You know, there's 60 million Americans with a criminal record, so it's a huge problem. What about here in Harris County? So we're seeing a lot of movement, right? Uh, you, you have a whole change of judges, right? You have commissioners that are looking at it from a different perspective. But we're still dealing with the bail issue. We're still dealing with, we're still dealing with a, lot of, a lot of individuals who are being placed for, for murder. Mm -hmm. So we haven't figured out how to deal with the death penalty yet in Harris County, which tends to be still one of those places where more people get the death sentence than anywhere in the country. we got to figure that out. And, 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 and that's, that was the crux of my question, right? So once, once upon a time... 
it was the case. And what I'm hearing you say, Dr. Henderson, is still upon a time, it is the case, that here in Harris County, we're sending more people to death than anyone, than anywhere else in the country. Meanwhile, um, we started the conversation by saying we're doing very well here in Texas. That's problematic for me, right? If we're still sending, more, for me, uh, and, you know, if we're still sending more people than anywhere else in the country to die, then why, why is that? Why, how can we still be doing well if that's the case, uh, particularly well, in a state that puts so much value around life? Well, and you could also uh, point to the fact we're having heat-related deaths in our prison system that we're still trying to address too. These aren't people that the people that weren't sentenced. But not to Mark, die. But you said but, we're doing all right. Well, I was talking about <laughs> but, but less crime and, and fewer people in prison. Yeah, that part. Right, but there's many part. aspects to the justice. <laughs> but I also wanted to pick up on you know the other thing about the death penalty is the law of the parties that you, we're trying to re, uh, revise that mm -hmm. here in Texas. Uh, the bill didn't quite make it last session. But but here's the deal. Well, there are a lot of bills that didn't quite make it I, last well, session. Let's be honest. Some good ones too. <laughs> Seven bills relating to women in prison, so they get feminine hygiene products. They're not shackled. It seems uh, pretty reasonable. But on this law of the parties thing, you don't have to be the trigger man. You don't even have to be at the scene, and you can be sentenced to death. Now, we have people on death row under law of the parties uh, now, even though in the last decade no one's been sentenced for this. So the, the, the current uh, prosecutors are not actually uh, sentencing people to death for but law of the parties, but couldn't. these people have accumulated. Right, right they, and they still could. Right. And these people are, are, are still lined up potentially to be executed. So. Um, we believe in this whole, it gets back to the overcriminalization issue, all these crazy laws. It's the issue of intent. You ought to have a certain level of intent, regardless of where you stand on the death penalty, to say that we're going to execute you. You ought to yeah, have an someone intent else that someone be killed. It, should, it right. shouldn't be transferred right. to you. Well, along those lines, how about the felony murder rule in Texas? Where you can have, you, you can drive recklessly, uh, have it, fleeing from the police, have an accident, and the person driving with you doesn't wear their seatbelt and gets thrown out of the car and dies, and you get charged with murder. But and that seems to be like a significant injustice to me, too. Yeah, now, of course, you can't get the death penalty for that no, type of thing. No, but you can get life in prison. Right. And, and, and I think we need to look without at that. Any without any intent again. Yeah. I mean, should, in fact, that's the question, Dr. Henderson. Should any crime be allowed to, to convict anyone if there's not a criminal intent? I don't think so, right? Because as a, the reality is we're evolving as a society, right? And what was justice 20 years ago may change, right? We used to incarcerate a lot of individuals who weren't directly responsible and did not intend to hurt people. We gotta reevaluate that. And I think that's what's happening now. You're having this bipartisan movement when they have a conversation about what justice actually looks like in these communities. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea is, so if you're driving and it's an accident, it's, it's, it's a manslaughter. It could be involuntary if it, if, if, but if it also didn't. under Texas law today can be felony murder. Yeah. That's and so, pretty scary. No. So is there any prospects of cleaning up the mess that, you know, we were optimistic we're doing good, but then, then we got all this stuff that you trash, you've been trying to get rid of you too. <laughs> and it does, you, and you make progress, yeah. but it doesn't seem to happen as quickly. Maybe we need to sunset all the criminal code, penal code, all the criminal, everything criminal in Texas and have it reevaluated by the Sunset Commission and decide what comes back. That yeah, or all these, all these laws, uh, criminal laws outside the penal code, if they automatically expired unless the legislature good. renews them. But uh, you also mentioned bail reform, which is important because that was another one. It passed a, a kind of watered down version of it passed the House this session, but we couldn't get it through the Senate. So uh, one of the problems we have in Texas is, as you know, Gary, if you're, um, you can, you, your bail can't be denied, you can't be denied release no matter how much money you have unless it's capital murder so for murder a judge can't just say I, I deny bail now they can set it at a million or two million but right. occasionally you have people like Richard Durst who can pay that and then dismember people so we need to uh, have <laughs> you know a preventive sure. detention provision that that has appropriate due process but then also make sure we don't have people in jail who aren't dangerous simply because they can't afford an arbitrary amount of money so that's kind of what we're going to work on for next session as well I want to I want to ask a question that it's it's related to criminal justice reform because we 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 have so many people that are incarcerated rated for it but I know that most of the people at home that are watching this show right now want to know one thing is it time to legalize marijuana in Texas it's been time to legalize <laughs> marijuana in Texas <laughs> what but, they really want to know but the other reality is and, and <laughs> we'll talk a lot about the legislation but the, the other reality is that prosecutors can make change without legislation and they have the ability and the discretion to yep. make a lot of change that doesn't require us to wait two more years. And I think the pressure has to be put on those individuals to make the right choice to figure out what can we incarcerate and what can we necessarily divert. 
That's a question I think we can have. So for, for those of you here in Houston that didn't realize what happened up in Dallas during the middle of the legislative session, uh, the district attorney there, John Cruzeau, who was a great drug court judge in Texas, was both the Democrat and Republican drug court judge, same drug court, one of the real pioneers in that. But he made an announcement during the middle of the legislative session about things he wasn't going to prosecute and changes he would make, including not seeking bail in a number of cases. But there was a particular one about stealing necessities that got uh, a lot of attention. Now, it turned out what he really meant was just a handful of cases, like where a pregnant woman steals um, formula or something, uh, very few cases, but it caused uh, a bit of an uproar. And so, um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, district attorneys have a ton of discretion um, in terms of what cases to bring. I think we would all say they don't have an obligation to charge everyone with every single crime on the book, or else we're all going to prison for using the wrong light bulb, you know, or having the, a, 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 not a low flow toilet or whatever the, right. the crime is. But I, I do have a follow up to that because it, from a from a, and, I, and I guess what I'm asking, and so it happened here in Harris County, right, where mm -hmm. um, the DA came in and said, hey, look, this is my new program in, in regards to possession of, uh, you know, a certain amount, four ounces of marijuana here in Harris County. But when you look at what's happening around the nation and, and, and as we're traveling around, we are still, even though it's prosecu the prosecutor's prerogative whether or not to do this as a state, we are still locking people up for what our neighbors are, are, are selling and making money off of by the Kukobs. Is it time, or, or my question is, from a policy perspective, is it still smart for us to say, here in Texas, we are outlawing you know, the, 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 this product that, you know, again, we're... we're so, so what happened last session is, so Governor Abbott had signaled in a gubernatorial debate that he was open to changing the laws on marijuana, and then there were 100 votes to pass a bill in the House um, that reduced it to a Class C misdemeanor, um, which is like a, you know, speeding ticket. And so then it was not taken up in the Senate, uh, you know, due to lack of uh, support. So, but I think that, you know, when you think about it, the amount of times these folks are taken to jail thousands of times every year and the cost to tax payers of incarcerating individuals for small amounts of marijuana. Um, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense what we're doing now. And then the other issue I'll add is people on probation who are caught with marijuana. There was a guy named Tyrone Brown who Governor Perry commuted, but he was going to go to prison for 40 years because he was revoked from probation for having a joint. Uh, now he was on probation for something more serious, but still, we're, it's not a good use of our resources. We also have a lot of individuals who are in our society who have criminal records because of this offense, right? And so we got to figure out how to go back and identify these individuals individuals to make sure we remove it from their records. So it's a, it's a process that we haven't figured out how to deal with because of the numbers that we're dealing Let with. Let me follow up on that comment. Uh, you, and and you, Mark mentioned it too, Dr. Henderson, but you said people have paid the price for their crimes and a certain period has already elapsed. Shouldn't they have the opportunity to clean up their record? They should. Uh, and, and why should it stay with you forever? Because that's what we've always done, Because a youthful done, right? indiscretion. Yeah, exactly. You messed up, and now you've been good. And in fact, I, and I see cases like this. I mean, people that messed up when they were in their teenage, mm -hmm. late teenage right. years, and them going to prison, come out, get an education, uh, get a great job, make a lot of money, very successful, and, and, and they're, they're stuck with, <laughs> under our presence, you've got to get a governor's partner, you get nothing, which right. seems a little harsh. It is. Simple death is a reality for a lot of individuals in our society, mm -hmm. and we haven't figured out how to deal with that just yet. So let, for folks know, so if you get deferred adjudication probation in Texas, you complete it, you can get a lot of stuff off your record, but up until a few sessions ago, if you actually had a conviction, even if you su uh, successfully completed probation, you could never get anything uh, removed. And so we passed uh, some legislation in the last few sessions that said if it's a first-time nonviolent misdemeanor, and then it was expanded to a first-time DWI, and then it was made retroactive. So that's where we stand, but a single nonviolent misdemeanor in your whole life, you can get it removed after a certain period of time. But other states have moved forward with a more ambitious proposals. Yeah, you have a clean track and, record. And, yeah. and, and the challenge with that is that most, most people, particularly in our communities of color, get stuck in this cycle in our, in our, in our lower yes. income and ah. in our lower income community get stuck in this cycle and don't realize that one crime does not, the term you used was civil death, that... If they don't realize, they also don't have the money. And they don't have the resources <laughs> to do that, right? And so how do we, you know, how do we better educate our communities or create access to what you're talking about? Because it's fine for us to go to Austin. I, I work in Austin throughout the legislative session. It's fine for us to go there and pass these laws, right? Um, the better question is, how do we actually get them from 
just being legislation we've passed, actually changing and impacting lives. Well, what we need to do is this clean slate policy that Pennsylvania and Utah have passed because it's automatic after a certain amount of That's time, what I was a nonviolent offense. You don't have to do anything. Yeah. You don't have to be informed. You've been clean for five or ten years. The, you're right, the system itself cleans your record off. Mm -hmm. Right, and obviously That's it doesn't cover idea. the really serious crimes. But still. But yeah, it's a, it gives people a real um, ability without having to hire a lawyer, without having to pay a filing fee, and so well, forth. Well, I know they can say that if you've ever been convicted of a, exactly. of a yeah. crime, but, the answer is no, because they cleaned yeah. it off. Right. Well, you also have the market of criminal record, right? Diva Page's right. great work that showed that a black without a criminal record had a worse chance finding a job than a white with a criminal record. So we have some systematic issues that exist beyond the criminal record. And so we have to deal with that and look at inequities in our society across the board, even before the criminal record. Well, an indigent defense is a big one. If you can't afford a lawyer, you know, to vigorously defend you, um, and you're not lucky enough to get someone appointed like Gary Pollan, uh, <laughs> I know you've done a few I will things. have you know, I tried to, I had a juvenile aggravated sexual assault case I tried last week, African-American kid, not guilty. Good job, Gary. Good job. He's a good kid. And I bulldozed the state's case, <laughs> as you might imagine. But yeah, there's been a number of examples of, of people, unfortunately, that, that don't, don't get, get lawyers, like lawyers that, that are really, <laughs> uh, strong advocates, yeah, right. you know, and they don't have the resources to hire an expert right. uh, to do the kinds of forensics testing that the prosecution right. can I got do. Everything. Don't judge, even bring up the rape kits. We'll yeah. leave that out. The, the judge gave me everything I asked for. I had everything I needed to properly defend this young man. Which judge was it? Uh, three, uh, three 14th. Good Democrat. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it under, but it started under a Republican who also gave me no, no, what no, I wanted. No, 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 Both no, of the no. judges were very generous. But, but, but gave me everything I asked for. Don't we get to a place where politics doesn't affect our way we enact justice? Mm -hmm. It should. Right? It, it shouldn't should matter not. what outside the aisle you're on. Exactly. Equity is equity. It shouldn't matter what color you are, fair is fair. And we should stop incarcerating people who would be better served by being in the community. At the end of the day, I think that's what we're fighting for. You look at this last legislative session, you had individual legislators who were ill-informed about the data behind a lot of these decisions. Think mm -hmm. about it. When we're trying to pass policies, we got to do more educating of policymakers that I didn't think we'd ever have to do, right? They, a lot of them don't know the research that's behind decisions that they're mm -hmm. enforced with judging. Yeah, but as, we make, as, as progress is made and we institute reforms that you two gentlemen support, we're going to have empirical data to demonstrate what's working and what's not working, right. which yeah. should be the compelling argument to, uh, to go forward with more, right. assuming you can show it works. Well, the, one of the best right. examples is here in Harris County with the pretrial diversion program for state jail felonies, right. which is most commonly possession of less than a gram of drugs, but literally the same profile people with the same uh, similar criminal histories and risk levels who go through that versus those that go through state jail, which is like six months going there. The recidivism difference, and this is from Dr. Theresa May in Harris County Probation, it's amazing. The people that are in the pretrial diversion do far better, uh, so and it costs far less. Uh, yeah, they're able so. to hold a job take care of their family it's a win-win sounds good yeah I mean I guess the, my, my my question would be why can't I mean y y you all are, are saying a lot of the same things you're experts in this what is it that our legislature isn't getting about this right <laughs> I mean we saw what we saw what Dallas, was you weren't trying to persuade him Dallas that I, 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 well <laughs> you know unfortunately well I won't go there Gary but uh, we saw with the First Step Act mm -hmm. what, what bipartisanship could accomplish in, on the federal level. Um, why can't we achieve that here? What is it that, that they're not getting? I think you're dealing with a, a reality of long-held beliefs, right? Uh, the criminal justice system is one of the few systems where emotion and belief dictate the order of the day, right? A lot of facts are not included. They're not allowed admiss or not made admissible. We got to figure out how to educate people and also hold them accountable to the information that we have. Well, yeah, and, and of course, there were some good things like the getting rid of the driver responsibility program, over a million people getting their driver's licenses back September 1st of this right. year. But th as you alluded to, a lot of excellent bills passed the House and didn't quite make it in the Senate. And one of the great developments during this interim is there's now a criminal justice reform caucus, uh, 10 members, five of each uh, party in the House. And I think that'll give us some more leverage as there's some discussions between both chambers going forward. So, um, I mean, again, the track record in Texas in terms of our incarceration rate, I mean, even 
even this year, our prison population has fallen precipitously and crime rates are continuing to decline. So what a lot of what's happening is, as you said, through district attorneys, through probation departments, implementing better practices, a lot of it isn't stuff that requires bills, but it's still having an impact. But there's a lot more we need to do, whether it's sentencing reform uh, for our drug crimes, bail reform. Uh, the uh, biggest issue last session was probably Sandra Bland legislation. We repeatedly tried to get through, and it did pass the House, saying you can't be arrested for a fine-only traffic offense unless it's breach of the peace. I mean, you, th she was arrested it's for failure logical. to signal. It's only logical. Yeah. But we can't forget about how we hold police more accountable. And the community is still arguing for ways in which to do that, right? And so if we do that, if we figure out how to hold the bad police accountable and recognize the good police, that would go a long way in a lot of minority communities. Yeah, and I would say civil asset forfeiture also builds distrust in many communities. Oh, uh, because you take people's stuff and then uh, they have to file a lawsuit to get it back, even if they're never convicted of anything. Right. And we've repeatedly tried to reform that. The problem is right. prosecutors get half the money and police get half. So they have right. a vested interest vested in interest. keeping the current system. They like having and the money. We can't even, we've had a bill that would just increase the burden of proof to say instead of preponderance the evidence, which is just a bit more than a coin flip, that it has to be clear and convincing evidence. So we'll that be would back seem with fair. Those. Yeah, yeah. Right. But the, the clear and convincing evidence that the property was associated with criminal activity. Uh, uh, Dr. Anderson, you mentioned the police and dealing with the bad police and good police. Is there more we can do as a, as a community to educate uh, young people in terms of interacting with the police? I think you can, but I think the uh, best I guess because do. of the, you know, the kind of the mutual, the idea of, the idea of mutual respect. Yeah, the police should be respected, right. citizens they interact with, but by the same token, I know that in my house, I taught my boys, Anytime you get you meet with the police, right. keep your hands on the wheel. Yes sir, right. no so, sir, no no gruff. If you know if, if you may have been treated unfairly, we'll deal with it later. Yeah, well, that's yeah. some that's, ahead, that's some great piece. <laughs> the legislature just passed a piece that requires just training that? in high school, right? Mm -hmm. This last session, I, I think we got to be more focused on it, making sure that the police and the community interact with each other without it being based upon someone going to jail, right? right. The mm -hmm. legislation session they just passed a piece that allows all high schools to be trained in this manner. We got to do that. We got to make sure that these kids are interacting with police positively Positive. outside of the uniform. No right. one's at risk of going to jail. Do it the way it should be done to interact with each other. And I, I want to add to that. I mean, just to the comment you made, I, yes, we should teach our children to be respectful of law enforcement. And they should but, be respectful but, uh, of the citizens. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, but now, you know, let's deal with the reality that what we've seen in this country over the last couple of years um, has been examples of of kids that either a weren't doing anything mm -hmm. or, or men that were Tamir Rice. That, right mm -hmm. right a kid with a, with a in a park right or a uh, uh, Philando Castile who mm -hmm. was driving his vehicle and was not being disrespectful to police and so we've got to get away from that part right so it's not just the yeah. it's not just the hey you got to be respectful because we're seeing people being gunned down um, you know senselessly even when they are yeah, yeah, but the positive of that is Dallas. And they all have those one thing the, in common, by the way, Gary. Those are rare. What? They're very, no, I That's understand. not true. It's become no. a reality. It's, no. it's become. They're rare. And there are so many interactions between the police and people of color in this country, and we only hear about a handful that I agree with you in, in some instances. It's every a handful instance, too many, Some Gary. instances. Well, every, every, any, inst any one would it's be too much. It's a handful too many. But you also have to recognize there have been a lot of interactions where nothing happens. Well, no, Thank training. God. That's yeah, the I way agree. it ought to be. Right. But well, no, and that's how it should but be. But the ones that have happened the bad have been apples, extremely brutal. Get yeah. rid of them. No, I that's understand what you're saying. And, <laughs> yeah, that is they're, and they're not. <laughs> and they get off with it. No. So let's... let's. Well, no, the bad apples need to be thrown away. Yeah. Like you throw away bad apples. There you go. And that gets kind of to, obviously, having a disciplinary process that's transparent that the public ah. can have confidence in. Right. And, good. you know, when there's an officer involved shooting... We put Dr. Henderson in charge. You know, he's like, <laughs> hey, I got it. We'll, we'll make it happen. <laughs> but... But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, like Senator Tim Scott, who's one of my favorite conservative Republicans from South Carolina, you know, he's talked about all the times he's gotten pulled over uh, for not doing anything wrong. Right. And so, uh, but I think training, you know, making sure police, as you said, have training right. and de-escalation tactics right. and things right. like that, right. um, and that they're, you know, we have to evaluate their performance, not on how many arrests they make well, or how many part people of they pull when over. when you talk about communicating and talking when you're not in an arrest situation, Part of it needs to be that there needs to be groups in front of the school assemblies where the police are talking to a group of, this, of students and, and t police saying, from our perspective, here's where I'm at when I'm stopping somebody and what, what I, my fears and worries. And then the students can say, here, well, here's where I'm at. I'm a person of color. I think I'm getting stopped because I'm driving while black, okay? Not a crime in America last time I checked. And I'm fearful because you're a white officer that somehow you're going you're gonna to do something to me that's not good. 
right? So I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what's going to happen with me. So then you kind of break down and through discussions that you, your group could facilitate, then how do we break down those barriers and understand that we have to be sensitive? Understanding, being a policeman is a hard job. But interacting with the police can be hard too. And I think the right. thing is we can prevent unnecessary negative interactions through dealing with things like outstanding warrants. So in Ferguson, the average household had three warrants, yeah, and these were mostly crazy. traffic warrants. There was a, yeah. a grandma with a warrant for an overgrown lawn. And so if all these people have warrants for this stuff, they're not going to be cooperating with police on the serious crimes, and it's going to be a pileup of warrants to enforce for minor things instead of focusing on the really well, that's, preventing that, that's, violence. That's, that's what we want to do. Absolutely. That's a good, good point. So we came up with a lot of good ideas. I think so. I think I, I think there's a lot of great discussion. Maybe and, we could do maybe so much we, more to we be could, had. I tell you what, we could do. We could take the show to Texas Southern, working Let's with Dr. It. Henderson, Let's do it. and we could have and we could do an assembly and have the police there with the students talking about their various concerns. I Listen, think it'd be a fascinating just, show. We just held a debate. We can uh, handle yeah. it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and on that on that note, Dr. Henderson, Mark Levin, I guess you should be a doctor of criminal justice reform. <laughs> Thanks for being here, and we'll be back next week with another exciting show on Red, White, and Blue.